hello and welcome to another magical Saturday stream. I am your host, of course, Joe Magician, and today we'll be talking about the House in the Song of Ice and Fire and potentially House of the Dragon that, you know, should be your favorite. I'm going to make the case that you sh whatever your favorite house is, you should change it. Unless it's the Strongs. I mean, stick with the Strongs. But um, definitely a strong contender for who should be your favorite house and the characters you should be looking forward to seeing the most. And that is, of course, <clears throat> uh, the Blackwoods. Those raven feather cloak wearing, old god worshipping Riverlanders with their dead weirwood and an outsized effect on Westeros with many fascinating characters and heroes. And that's all before we even talk about their most infamous son, a three-eyed crow and god of the weirwoods, Brendan Rivers himself. Of course, a Blackwood. Sort of. Half Blackwood. There we go. Um, <laughs> the Blackwoods managed to have their beaks in just about every important event in Westeros in a way that seems almost magical. And that might be the right word for the raven-haired wizards and bowmen of the Blackwood Vale. Despite having lost their crowns hundreds and thousands of years ago at different times, the Blackwoods are a player in Westeros' past and future that should not be ignored and instead should be celebrated. And that will be our focus today. And honestly, maybe next stream as well, depending on how far we get today. I kind of oversold exactly how much was going to be in this video uh, or the stream I was doing my my outline for this and I just sort of kept writing and writing and writing and I barely got out of the age of the Andal invasion like I think I got up to the <laughs> the, the Heron Horse invasion of uh, the Riverlands and that's kind of where I stopped <laughs> yeah spooky fingers on magical that's how we do but yeah we're that's what we're gonna be talking about today we're gonna be talking about the Blackwoods um before we get going do some uh normal promo stuff i want to go ahead and thank let's see here oh the super chats are gone come back um there was one from ramona Zam zamphir earlier let me see if i can scroll up and find it um her and maura lee both sent okay there we go um uh, 20 pounds for ramona zamphir this looks like a good opportunity for me to mention my theory of missy being a stark on his mother's side Though, through one of the her mother's side, through one of her four daughters, Gregan had from Alsane Blackwood. Good theory. The Blackwoods and the Starks end up being uh, a very strange alliance, and we're going to go over why it's a strange alliance. But it's a consistent one. The Starks and the and the Blackwoods basically end up being one and the same after a certain point. Um, but thank you so much for that one, Ramona. Uh, and then for fifty dollars from Morally, Morally, the MVP of Super Chats, apparently coming through again. Uh, thank you for all you do. You are the best. No, thank you, Mor. Appreciate it a lot. Um, I'm guessing this is going to be one of your more favorite ones. <laughs> Magical fingers to tickle the like and subscribe button. <laughs> that one sounds a little weird. Um, also, oh, $10 super chat from the Purple Lord Leo Anasi. Nancy. There it is. Oh, that's from uh, American Gods. My tinfoil theory is that the Night's King was a Blackwood, and that is why the Starks ran him out of the North for name, forbade their name and changed the name of the Blackwood. Hey, that sounds familiar. Yeah, uh, I talked about that idea in my last stream about the others, about the origin of them, and how. There may be a connection between um, the Blackwoods and the Night King and the others themselves. Uh, we're definitely going to go over that today. There's a lot of stuff here about the um, the First Men and the Age of Heroes and all that stuff. But we're going to get that one, Leo. I like your thinking. Um, as for like uh, promo stuff, uh, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you're watching. Uh, what, let's see here. We got... We're going to be giving away some more shirts today because I still have codes to give away. Um, so when we get to, let's start at 50 likes, 63 people watching. We get the 50 likes, we'll give away a t-shirt and we'll go up by 25s from there. Um, so yeah, 
Just go ahead and <laughs> use your magical fingers to massage the like button. Good God, that sounds that doesn't sound any good. Smash the like button. Do that one instead. Um, also, if you feel like, oh, I'm sorry, I I missed. Uh, Danny McKay sent in his uh, usual five dollars on PayPal, saying Happy Saturday, Happy Saturday to you too, Danny. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, if you want to support me in the channel, obviously super chats are an option. You can also send them through PayPal. There's a link down in the description of this stream. Um, it's also Patreon at Patreon.com/slash Joe Magician. But you know, don't. do whatever you feel like. I mostly just want you to. Like and subscribe if you enjoy what I'm doing because that helps out more than anything. So, yeah. Uh, we also got for what's coming up, still working on that video. I think I've thrown out what I was doing twice and I think I got a good idea now, but it's going to be longer and it kind of changed in scope. So, look out for that one. And um, the Dying of the Light read through, we're still working on that. Um, that 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 episode is very late at this point. I think it's like a month and a half late. Um, but the the subject matter and ended up kind of messing with my head for a bit. So I finally got around to kind close to finishing it. Um, probably gonna be finishing it up today and tomorrow. Um, have it mostly written to sort of need to record and get all that stuff out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's see here up uh, chapter 13 of dying of the light so we're like here we're basically we're basically done with it there's only a few more i'm gonna have to do some recordings when what is the five-year gap video incoming i already did that one um that's on the channel now uh let me grab the i did that one a while ago i think it was a it was like a five minute video on what is the five-year gap hang on a second unless you mean a longer one i don't think i'm doing that um let's see here well i do have to go back quite a ways to find something that was not stream really need to change that uh this is the five-year gap video there you go oh there you go hey aziz how's it going oh by the way um i was gonna say this but since it just popped up History of Westeros has two awesome long form videos on House Blackwood. Um, I probably should have watched them before doing this, but it's been a while. I just sort of wanted to do it off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, go check out their channel. They have two episodes on House Blackwood. I know it's um, Aziz and Ashea is one of their favorite houses. They like talking about them all the time. And this is probably a good time to say that I'm going to be uh, appearing on History of Westeros, I believe, next weekend. Um, for their Valar reread is talking about uh, the freehold of Valyria. I, I believe the origins and um, everything up to the Giscari Wars. I think that's what Aziz said we were going to do. But yeah, so dairy for that one. That one's going to be a lot of fun. I know one of Aziz's favorite um, <laughs> Crusader Kings campaigns that he ever did was his house Blackwood one, which unfortunately failed because the software failed him. Otherwise, he was doing pretty good. <laughs> oh, I also wanted to uh, do a quick shout out here. Um, you guys may have, well, I know you guys know you, you, uh, the intro video that I use for my video, the link is always down in the description to who makes it, but it's a, um, let's just scroll up and grab this. Let me grab the, the email one. I'm going to put the links in here too. Um, a musician named, uh, Manuel, where is it? Where is it? Oh, this is an, it's in a different email. I'm sorry. Um, hang on a second. I got to find this one. I'm just going to, I'm going to give a shout out to the guy because, um, he, uh, 
he's been his music is just incredible and he launched a new website um where he's giving some away others available for licensing and um really talented and good to work with um his name's manuel semft uh where did he send this to oh okay that's why i can't find it it's in this other email um he's responsible for the spooky bassoon at the beginning of the video uh he clarified what the instruments were he said um it's mostly a bassoon in the beginning and then there are some woodwinds and different strings that are coming in um but yeah here's the link to his music archive archive if you're a content creator in any way if you have podcast youtube channel or anything like that i would highly recommend checking out his stuff um a lot of it is creative commons or for free as with attribution he also will um license it if you're a money-making operation i've had no problems with them um great stuff and obviously the spooky bassoon has been um pretty significant part of the channel so i wanted to thank um well he calls himself manu thanks manu weird that i know two manus but yeah thanks manu for um the music for all these years um hope you guys check him out for it he he makes he makes some really great stuff um oh super chat from uh jenna s uh ten dollars first time catching a live sorry if i'm late not late at all i'm running late it's actually the opposite big fan of your videos and your garden on instagram that's right uh garden is coming back uh, on the growing strong youtube channel once we're gonna start the seed soon um house blackwood is super dope agreed thanks so much Jenna. glad you got to catch one um oh we just hit 50 um 50 likes on the channel so we're gonna go ahead and do a um do a giveaway here so we're gonna give away a t-shirt here we're gonna do a keyword what should we raven so if you want to um enter giveaway for a free t-shirt from my threadless shop at threadless.com slash show magician um, I think that's what it is. Type the word Raven into chat and in about five minutes, we'll roll it and give, give someone a code to go get it. Um, I'm gonna remember this time to actually do it. So it's 228, so 233. We'll go ahead and give away a code to somebody. All right, I think that's that's probably about all the promos that I have today. Uh, so let's get going with the actual stream itself. Got a good opening quote here. One of my favorites because it kind of boils down to a lot of what George is using the Blackwoods to do. I mean, there is a lot of magical and weirdness around them, but it's also very much a he uses them as to tell a story about grudges and how people do, how people like shoot themselves in the foot over and over again because they can't get over something long ago and just how it continues to destroy things to the current day. Um, so the quote here is, we've had a hundred pieces with the Brackens, many sealed with marriages. There's Blackwood blood in every Bracken and Bracken blood in every Blackwood. The old king's peace lasted half a century, but then some fresh quarrel broke out and the old wounds opened and began to bleed again. That's how it always happens, my father says. So long as men remember the wrongs done to their forebears, no peace will ever last. So we go on century after century with us hating the Brackens and them hating us. My father says there'll never be an end to it. Kind of a depressing take there from, I believe it's, uh, that's Hoster Blackwood, I believe, talking to Jamie, uh, Jamie Lannister. And yeah, and that's, that's kind of the story of the Blackwoods, their history and their grudges with the, Bla with the Brackens, even, the, even though there is really no difference between them anymore. This sort of petty wars that continue from 
you know, injustices done long ago that they just can't get let go of is something that's very resonant for the rest of A Song of Ice and Fire in general. And perhaps for a lar the larger meta story about the others and the and humanity and the children of the forest that, you know, whatever actually is motivating the others and the children of the forest back then and now is about things that things and people that are long dead that could just be forgotten about and move forward and that's something to uh something that's been sort of a bubbling part of a song of ice and fire that i've been enjoying thinking about um so let's start off let's talk about the actual history of the blackwood family um we know them today as well, you may, I'm going to go ahead and forgive people that you may not remember the Blackwoods too much from the main series because they are honestly not a giant part of it. You see Titus Blackwood, you see his children, they're part of Rob Stark's army, but otherwise, except for Jamie's um, journey to go uh, forge a peace with the Blackwoods out after they have held out from supporting Rob, they, they have been largely off the page. Obviously blood Raven is a Blackwood himself, but that's not really how he's presented in the story. Um, he's more presented as part of the children of the forest than he is like an active part of house Blackwood. Um, so we're just going to quickly go over who they are and we're, we're going to roll through this. Um, so the Blackwoods themselves are a prominent ancient power and powerful Riverlander house, notable for being one of the very, very few old gods worshiping houses outside the North at this point. Um, there are rumors that there are old god worshiping houses that are not the Blackwoods, but they generally keep them keep to themselves about what they do, and it's nowhere near as open as the Blackwoods largely because they fear reprisal from their uh, Faith of the Seven neighbors. Or, yeah, it, that tends to be, that's actually one of the problems the Blackwoods end up having throughout the series and their, and their history is this kind of religious war that um, kind of bumbles, bumble, bubbles up over and over again. Um, Noobs, yes, smash the like and subscribe button. All right, uh, let's see here. We got 20 people entered. Last call for type Raven in chat if you want to live your, win yourself a um, free t-shirt from my Threadless shop. Don't like how biased George is towards the Blackwoods. Well, I'm not sure if it's biased. He just really likes them. It's, not, it's, it's his story. He can write whatever he likes with it. Um, All right, here we go. We're going to roll this. See who wins. Um, uh, John Silver. Congratulations, John. Um, so you can message me on Twitter. You can just DM me or you can email me at Ask Joe Magician at gmail.com. I'll send you a code. You can pick up something from my Threadless shop. Way to go, buddy. Um, <laughs> not wild cards. What are you doing? Nobody likes wild cards. Only George likes wild cards. So anyway, back to the Blackwoods themselves. Them being the only old god worshipping house basically outside the north sets them up just at a basic level as being strange and something to pay attention to. And part of that, part of the reason for that is that even though they are a Riverlander house, they are not from the Riverlands. Um, they are a exiled house from the North that long ago journeyed down and settled themselves in the Riverlands. And the history of why that happened is, is a little obfuscated. The Blackwoods themselves don't really say what happened. The Northerners um, don't seem to remember at all what happened. It's it's a very strange, it's almost a little mystery that George presents where he's like, he gives you this basic info about the Blackwoods, that they are an old God's house who used to be from the North and no longer are. What ended up happening there? Um, 
and he sort of sprinkles in different little stories and legends and stuff like that and sort of invites you to solve the mystery of the Blackwoods. What ended up happening? Why are they down in the Riverlands? Why aren't they in the North anymore? <clears throat> so the story goes that the Blackwoods, when they are from the North, originally held the lands known as the Wolfswood. The Wolfswood itself is a giant, giant forest in the north to the west of Winterfell, going all the way from Sea Dragon Point down to about the northern edge of the um, the Barrowlands. It's it's a giant forest, maybe the biggest in Westeros. And supposedly the Blackwoods used to rule it. They claim that they were driven out of the Wolfwoods and the north themselves by the Starks, the Kings of Winter. No real explanation of why. What did they do? What was the crime? Um, and why were they like run off instead of exterminated like the Starks did to so many of their enemies? And well, they, they honestly exterminated a lot of their enemies or they made peace with them. What did the Blackwoods do that made them exiled? That, that's really unusual for the North. It's this kind of strange story. <laughs> they disagreed with the Starks on which side of the heart tree to hang the entrails of their enemies. Well, no, you're not not super far off from what I think happened. Um, so they were driven out from the north, they migrate south, and they end up in the Riverlands, kind of the inverse of the Manderleys. The Manderleys are driven out from the the Reach, end up in the far north, um, swear themselves to House Stark, and establish themselves there. So what exactly happened here? And I think one of the main stories I think that kind of informs what's going on here is the story of the war king we talked about him in the last um stream about the others and their origins and what they really want um just for a refresher of who the war king is this is from the world of ice and fire chronicles found in the archives of the night's watch at the night fort before it was abandoned speak of the war for sea dragon point wherein the starks brought down the war king and his inhuman allies the children of the forest when the war king's last redoubt fell, his sons were put to the sword, along with his beasts and green seers, whilst his daughters were taken as prize by their conquerors. All right, so let's go ahead and break this down. Let's talk about this. So obviously the hum inhuman allies, the children of the forest. So we're, t we're being told that there's a connection between the war king and the children of the forest. And there's definitely a connection between the Blackwoods and the Children of the Forest. Obviously, they are old gods worshippers. That's kind of a really basic one. But it's also all the ravens about them and some other weird things that they do. Like the um, the raven cloak. Their sigil has a weirwood on it themselves. A blood raven is a living example of their connection to the Children of the Forest. So it does seem that there's kind of this weirdness that there's there's a an unusual connection between the children of the forest and the Blackwoods and the same you can see here at the war king uh, when he was driven out of the north so a war king is it's a wolf skin changer but they are skin changers and oftentimes skin changers are green series and we see from that quote that yes they did have green series as well members of the war king's kingdom of his family were green seers skin changers and wargs so, yeah, compare that back to the Blackwoods. That sounds pretty similar. We know that the Blackwoods seem to have that kind of weird magical connection, kind of seem to have a lot of skin changers among their myths, like known or unknown. Um, and there's also the idea of Sea Dragon Point. Um, if you're not a particular geography nerd of <laughs> A Song of Ice and Fire, that, that place doesn't really mean a lot to you. But if you look at the map... It's actually the very northern part of the Wolfswood. Um, the Sea Dragon Point goes down through Glover lands all the way down to the Wolfswood um, with after apparently the Blackwoods lost the Wolfswood to the Starks. The Starks kept a lot of it for themselves. They gave the rest to the Glovers. And Sea Dragon Point has sort of just existed since then as this place of ancient uh, destroyed strongholds, that kind of thing. Um, it's been sort of, it's been sort of left to rot, but the, the, there's, 
they're right next to each other. They basically are the same thing. Um, and when you look at what's actually at Sea Dragon Point, you see that there are weirwood circles of trees. There's a lot of bogs and hills, which are heavily associated with the children of the forest. The ancient destroyed uh, strongholds, and it's basically been left to what to go back to the wild. There's basically nothing there, which again speaks to the Starks essentially kicking whoever lived there out. And I think that makes a very easy connection to the idea that perhaps the Ward King and his family or some of his followers are the very same people that ended up um, going south and settling in the Riverlands and becoming known as the Blackwoods. Um, it, it's, it's just... It just makes sense. It just it clicks so nicely. Um, oh, um, let's see here. At a hundred likes, we'll give away another T-shirt. So go ahead and slam that like button if you guys are enjoying what you're hearing. Um, but then you also look back at what the what the Stark said to the Ward Kings. It says that they put his sons to the sword and took his daughters as prized by the conquerors. So. It's interesting that the Starks aren't the War Kings, they're the Kings of Winter, but their sigil is a wolf. It kind of makes you wonder if the connection between the Starks and the Direwolves is something that they acquired by essentially taking the War King's daughters. And when, you, when I was talking earlier about the connections of marriage between the Starks and the Blackwoods, it kind of makes you wonder if that's sort of where that idea came from, because... They, they keep marrying each other over hundreds and hundreds of years, despite being really not that connected. Um, it's very likely that there is a blood connection between the Stark line and the, and the Blackwoods, at least going back far away. Um, that means blood is related to the Starks uh in a very very distant way i mean this would have been thousands of years so at that point it really doesn't mean anything but um the starks and the blackwoods have remarried each other so many times that it's it's highly likely that yeah um the, that blood raven on some level has some stark dna rolling around in him george is not very good about keeping the exact family trees together but it's it's very common it's very likely and it's also likely that on the other side that all the starks are Blackwoods. Um, so I think that part, and I think there's another way you can back this up, and that's in their name, the the name Blackwood. That's kind of a strange name. Um, it's, it's a little weird, especially because you look at their sigil, and it's not like a black tree or anything. It's just a weirwood surrounded by ravens on a, um, it's a, I think it's, a white tree and a black background with red outline with ravens on it. So the name and the sigil don't really match. Why would they be called the Blackwoods? Why don't they be anything else? Like what? what there's other houses too that have um, weirwood imagery on their on their names, and they don't have. They're not called that. It's it's a little weird. So I think the the hint to this is the prefix of the name black onto the last onto the main part of the name wood. Uh, when you look at how black isn't used by George in a song of ice and fire, it often means somebody that's a bastard or some kind of evil person or connected to the night's watch. Like you have Black Walder from House Frey who has that nickname for being a tremendous dick. Um you have the uh the character known as Black Lauren of the Ironborn, he got his nickname for being a tremendous murdering dick. Um, there's also a character in the past known as Black Robin, who was an outlaw. It's probably something to do with Robin Hood, maybe like an even Rob, evil Robin Hood or something like that. And then from the Night's Watch, you get characters like uh, Black Jack and Black Benar. So very often, that's how it's being used. So there's... When you look back and look back to the north, there's actually quite a lot of houses that have the root name wood in them. Um, so you have the Hornwood, um, you know, noble house to the east of the Starks. You have this random house called the Greenwoods, which are an, extent, an extinct line of former kings wiped out by the Starks. 
could have some connection to the War King. And then there's the the very, very... Sh I don't know how I missed this before. There's actually a House Woods left in the north. They're described essentially as a clan. The, um, more like the, the hill people or the mountain men. Where do they live? They live in the Wolf's Wood. So it could be very likely that House Woods, or the clan woods, I guess, is what's left of the... Um, the War King's family in the north, the ones that stuck around that weren't actually exterminated by the Starks, and the quote-unquote Blackwoods, the ones that went south, are those that ran away from the Starks during the during the um, the conquest of the War King. Um, I think you can make the case that all these houses may have the sort of a shared lineage going back to maybe House Wood or House of Woods or something like that. Because you see that same kind of thing happen. Like the Starks have, um, the Starks have branched out themselves in the same way. There's the House Car Stark, which is a an offshoot of House Stark named after Carlin Stark, eventually creating their own house named after him. And then, of course, you had in White Harbor, you had the Gray Starks, who were a sort of a not, I think, a second son house that ended up. Uh, allying with the Boltons to fight the, the main Stark house themselves. So the idea that there's a root name that gets added onto and ended up in else, elsewhere is a pretty common thing. And I think that's probably where the name Blackwood comes from. Um, they also... The Starks also share their... I mean, the Blackwoods share their weirwood symbol with a few other houses in kind of weird places. Um, so you have House Forrester. Mostly they're from the um, the Telltale Games, um, Game of Thrones game, but they I think they do appear in the main series. And their sigil is basically the Blackwood sigil, but without the ravens outside of it. Um, it's like a... And it has a sword down the middle of it, but it's pretty damn close. Um, you also have House Stain, which is the, um, I believe they're Skagosi, uh, which kind of makes the case that, you know, that's sort of an older symbol that goes back um, really, really far. But the other one that kind of caught my attention is House Stone Tree. Um, House Stone Tree is a group of ironborn that are sworn to the Harlaws. And they they themselves basically have the inside of the um, the Blackwood sigil just as their thing. It's a diff it's a gray instead of white, but it's basically the same thing just without the ravens around it. And I'm wondering if that might be sort of a hint of connection here between the Blackwoods, the War King, and Sea Dragon Point, because after the Starks drove the the War King out of Sea Dragon Point and presumably the Wolfswood as well, Sea Dragon Point was kind of left to left on its own. Um, it's been conquered back and forth many times by the Ironborn. Um, because obviously there's no one left to protect it. It used to be occupied. It's no longer. So it's an easy place, the Ironborn, to land and then try to move out from there and conquer stuff. So the stone trees having this sort of weirwood symbol as their sigil may be kind of a hint that the war king had maybe made common cause with the ironborn against the winter against winterfell that as the starks were coming on to kill them that perhaps they just sort of reached for whoever they had and perhaps some refugees of the war king and his family ended up in the iron islands or maybe there was intermarriage or maybe they were taken essentially as um thralls and salt wives as we are told happened at the end of um the end of the war kid conflict with the starks it's one of those things that if you wanted to make like a very tin foily connection there it is strange that there's a weirwood iconography in the in the iron islands they pretty much view the weirwoods as evil they like ig the demon tree is not a thing they're a big fan of which most people think is a giant weirwood um they seem to enjoy <laughs> fucking with the old gods and not taking them as um, their iconography or their sigils. So loose there, but it, maybe it's something there. Um, yeah, the hint about Naga's ribs being petrified weirwood, they seem to enjoy cutting them down <laughs> rather than um, 
than worshiping them. <laughs> who doesn't want to intermarry to the shitheads of Asshole Island? People who are desperate do that. And the Ward King and his family were desperate. Um, I'm sorry, I went on a rant there. Let me see what's going on in the chat. Oh, a super chat here from no, 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 no. Two Canadian dollars. Thank you so much. Um, Sea Dragon Point Naga, a link to the Grey King. Yeah, that could very well be true. Um, it would be interesting if the Grey King is a description of the Ward King, like a historical figure that got turned into um, a legend of some kind, or there's some sort of mixing there. Uh, Dr. Debunk, the Wolf's Wood probably used to be called the Blackwood. Very well could be. Um, after the conquest, maybe the name was changed. Um, the Starks, yeah, the Starks didn't used to hold the Wolf's Wood. It, it made sense that they eventually took it for themselves because obviously it's kind of bad tactically to have a huge open forest that leads right up to your doorstep. Um, but yeah. Love the Foresters. The Foresters are good. They've got uh, some good history to them. That the, the connection between the stone trees and like the Ward King and the Blackwoods, that's super tinfoil. There's like very little there, but you can sort of make, you can draw a connection if you feel like it, which I felt like doing. Uh, Melissa Blackwood, the women were called Blackwood because of their hair color. That's true. A lot of the... Um, Blackwood women got the were called uh, got the nickname Black as well. Um, <clears throat> let me scroll up here. I probably missed some stuff. It sort of went off there. I was reading all the stuff and I was excited about it. Um, Uh, Christina Kittle says, I think the fact that their thing is a weirwood and ravens is significant, like Gurm is raving a big old magic flag. Yes, exactly. George is signaling from the jump that these are somebody to pay attention to, that there's something strange going on. Um, Uh, Lord Joker, how do I donate? Well, there's a super chat button somewhere nearby on the, on your screen. It's a little outline, I think, with a dollar symbol on it. There's also uh, PayPal down in the description if you want to give that way. Or there's Patreon at patreon.com slash Joe Magician. Um, if you feel like donating, those are the best ways to do it. I don't really care which one. <laughs> it's up to you. Uh, group of... Edward Martin said, group of the first men that never took to worshiping the old gods and spilled a lot of blood in the mainland. Uh, yeah. Um, what we know about the, the war king and his, and his descendants is that basically there's a void left in the wolf's wood. And I, th I think it just makes a lot of sense that that void became partially the Blackwoods. And I think you can sort of take these different stories and then weave them into a fairly... Um, a fairly cohesive history of the Blackwoods in the North, what happened to them, why they ended up where they are. So just to quickly go through this, um, probably the Ward King of Sea Dragon Point, a member of House, let's say Wood, or House Woods or something like that, who found themselves allied with the children of the forest. They probably had the sigil of a Weirwood, <clears throat> and they had an explosion in their family of skin changers and green seers that... Um, they essentially were creating a unnatural advantage for themselves over their neighbors as they were being gifted these powers from the children of the forest. Um, you can imagine that maybe something like the current generation of the Starks where like everybody's ending up a skin changer, everybody's uh, developing these kind of powers, very powerful thing to happen. Um, and then they ruled from probably Sea Dragon Point all the way down through the Wolfswood. Naturally, because they're neighbors to the Starks and the Narc and the Starks at this time are, as Maester Lewin called them, hard men for hard times. 
They are pretty warlike and they're up for conquest at basically all times. So being neighbors and the Starks are expansionist, uh, expansionist conquerors, they end up in conflict with each other. Um, something changes, something happens, and the Starks decide that they're not going to tolerate the, the Warg King and these skin changers and all that stuff to the west of them, and they essentially declare total war on the family, on the Warg King and his allies. They end up becoming wiped out by the Snarks. They lose the war totally. They catch every member of House Woods or what became House Blackwood. They could and kill them. Um, the women they caught, they probably took to... Maybe they married them to members of their family. That's, that's fairly common. Or they made them servants or something like that. However, knowing that the Starks are essentially genociding the family out of existence. You can imagine that the ones who could ran away as fast as they could. They got the hell out of the north. They knew the Starks were coming for them, so they run south. They end up um, maybe taking on the name Blackwood. They may have had it already. Um, they make a f but they make their home far away in the Riverlands, finding this giant weirwood to base their new home around. They may have been guided there by the children of the forest and the old gods. As we know, there's a, a, a very strong connection between the two of them. Perhaps they had green dreams on where they had to go, found their way to Blackwood Vale. Um, I'm guessing the name it came second, that it had something to do with their exile, stat their exile status. Um, or perhaps... Blackwood Vale already had the name and they took it, but I would guess it went the other way, that the name came with them, considering there's a bunch of, you know, wood names back in the north. Um, but maybe all of them probably didn't go south. Maybe some of them went north too, as Bloodraven later would, and maybe seek out the children of the forest for help, as they are allies and obviously they are skin changers and green seers. Like, why not? Why not go seek them out? That makes a lot of sense. You'll notice, by the way, that this particular little story sounds a little bit like the, uh, the last hero story. And the theory that uh, Purple Lord Leo um, and Nancy talked about earlier, and I talked about in my previous stream, is that these, these descendants of the War King, who may have ended up going north, may eventually have become the Others. Um, because they are the exact, when you're looking for who would, who among the humans would betray humanity for revenge, who would take up the children of the forest on this kind of dark bargain to enhance their powers, to get revenge on the North and the Starks in particular, the Ward King seems to fit the bill. You have angry people, bitter from losing their lands, their families being killed. You have, they are already closely aligned with the children of the forest ahead of time, their allies. They themselves have naturally occurring green sight and skin changer powers on their own. And yeah, it's, it would be kind of easy for the children of the forest to essentially take these, uh, these blackwoods that went North, point them back at the Starks, empower them with magic and say, go get them. Like that makes a ton of sense. Um, Well, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Lord Joker, 10 pounds. Tell us the tale of Waymar Royce drunk in the shower. Don't quite know what that means, but thanks for the super chat. Um, I think that makes an easy story for how, why the Blackwoods are in the South, who they used to be, and what that conflict is. Because otherwise, there's really nothing in the, in the books themselves. As far as the Blackwoods are concerned, they just got kicked out, no good reason. And it kind of makes sense if they were, um, if they tried to forget that part of their lives. So I think that um, that sort of gets us to the Riverlands themselves. Um, there's a lot more sort of the migration to the Riverlands and establishing themselves down there. There's a lot more sort of fog of history stuff going on here. As much as George talks about the Blackwoods, and he loves inserting them to all his plots. He wants them to 
basically they pop up in every war and conflict you can imagine that vaguely involves the Riverlands. We really don't know a lot about their history. Um, and especially how they ended up down in the, um, down in the Riverlands. So what we do know is before the Andal invasion, hint, hint, others timeline of attack that I think it happened around the Andal invasion, just saying, uh, the Blackwoods settle in what's known as Blackwood Vale. Um, it would be unusual, honestly, if they didn't name it themselves because most of the time when, uh, houses take territory or, um, places from other houses, they don't rename it. Like even like you look at the Lannisters and Casterly Rock, it's not Lannister Rock, it's Casterly named after, Ca after house Casterly. The Baratheons, after they took Storm's End, didn't rename it. It's still Storm's End. That kind of stuff happens, um, happens all the time. It's very, it's not common for a house to take something and then rename it. They usually keep whatever name was already there. Um, so I'm guessing that the Blackwoods themselves named it Blackwood Vale and it didn't go the other way. But who knows, lost the history. So Blackwood Vale itself is a heavily wooded valley in the Riverlands near the Red Fork, a little bit north of what would later become River Run, the Sea of House Tully. It sits roughly between Old Stones and River Run, and also kind of central to the Red and Blue Forks. It's a very fertile valley. That's what a vale is, a vale is a valley. Um, highly defensible and has this gigantic weirwood. Um, So if you were looking for somewhere to settle, like if you were playing a uh, civilization and you were trying to figure out a spot in the Riverlands that you would want to essentially settle in, Blackwood Vale is ideal. It has, um, has everything you want. Defensible, fertile, easy access to rivers, um, sort of sits in the middle of a bunch of stuff without really being, there's a lot of buffers between the Blackwoods and different, um, different parts of the Riverlands, like they're not directly on the coast, they're not directly on the river, um, and it's easy for them to defend. Like valleys are relatively easy to do that with. Um, oh, hey, Urs, Tosh Green from Poland. My flight to Ukraine was stopped because of the invasion. Slava, Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, that sucks. Sorry, buddy. Um, Hope Ukraine can defend themselves. Not to get all political, but of course I have been doing that a lot on social media, but yeah. And you guys in Ukraine or that area, hope things work out well for you and all that. Um, first live stream I got to catch in action. This is great stuff from Dematio32. Hey, thanks for coming. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, So yeah, um, in terms of the migration south from the Blackwoods, Blackwood Vale as a location makes perfect sense. It seems like a great spot. Um, also during this time, although later it becomes weird that the Blackwoods are the only Old Gods worshippers, when they did this, everybody else was Old God worshippers because they were all first men. So they would have had no problem fitting in and finding their own little spot in the Riverlands. Um, just another word, Old God worshipper, perfect. We all are. What's the problem? No problem. Everything works out. Uh, there's also during this time very little um, kind of united kingdoms as we would know them in the current time. There's hundreds of petty kings. Everybody's calling themselves a king. Um, so it's not like they had to fight off a giant force in order to get themselves lands. It's essentially a bunch of smaller, weaker petty kings that could feasibly be fought off by one house without needing, um, without needing help from anybody. And although this is in the ancient times, like there were Westeros was less populated than it is now, but it wasn't so unpopulated that you could just sort of walk in and take an entire valley for yourself. You probably would have had to take it from somebody. Um, 
So you're sort of setting it up that the Blackwoods probably had to take Blackwood Vale Ale from somebody. Um, oh yeah, good call, uh, Leah Rubenfeld. It is close to Old Stones. It's south of Old Stones, um, which is the ancient home of the Muds. So it's per- it's fairly likely that if you're talking about how did the Blackwoods get established in this area, it may have been through House Mud itself. They may have been vassals to House Mud at some point. Um, but we're going to get into that here because we're going to talk about the Brackens. The Brackens finally come into the story. Uh, the ancient and historical fight between the two of them. Um, House Bracken and House Blackwood, the, the Hatfields and McCoys of Song of Ice and Fire, the guys that just cannot stop fighting no matter how many times they make peace. Oh, um, by the way, one more person hits like. We're going to give away another t-shirt. Uh, 112 watching, 99 likes, slam that like button, and one of you can get a um, free shirt from my Threadless shop. Oops, sorry about that. So the Blackwoods, uh, this is sort of what I was talking about with like the fog of history going on with the Blackwoods. They don't have an explanation for how they came into possession of Blackwood Vale. As far as the Blackwoods are concerned, it's always been theirs. They just kind of showed up and said ours, and that that was the end of it. The Brackens tell uh, a very different tale. Uh, The Brackens say that they were once kings who had their crowns usurped by their disloyal vassals. Hmm. Oh, there we go. You guys hit it. Uh, so let's, let's do another giveaway. Um, keyword this time will be, um, Weirwood. So if you want to win a free t-shirt from my Threadless shop, go ahead and type the word Weirwood to, to be entered. And when you look at the geography of this sort of this area around the red and the blue forks, Stonehenge and Raven Tree Hall are basic our neighbors. Um, they are basically they sit on opposite sides of the red fork of the Trident. Um, the the Brackens and Stonehenge on the south side, Raven Tree Hall and the Blackwoods on the north side of the river. Um, and if the Brackens ever were kings, as they say they were, it's fairly likely that the the lands the Black Hole the Blackwoods hold would probably be a part of it. Um, but there's a uh, there's differing tales about this. the The Blackwoods and the Brackens disagree about who was first and who was king and who was vassal and um, all that stuff. So there's two quotes here. Um, so this is coming from the Blackwood side. It is my Lord, the boy said, but some of our histories were penned by the maesters and some by ours centuries after the events they purport to chronicle. It goes back to the age of heroes. Blackwoods were Kings in those days. The Brackens were petty Lords renowned for breeding horses rather than pay their King his just due. They used the, the gold their horses brought to hire swords and cast him down. So the Blackwoods make the case that they were the kings and the Brackens were rebellious vassals that screwed them over. From the Bracken side, this is what they say. That seemed to satisfy Lord Jonos. We will be content with whatever portion my lord thinks fair. If I may offer you some counsel, though, it does not serve to be too gentle with these Blackwoods. Treachery runs in their blood. Before the Andals came to Westeros, House Bracken ruled this river. We were kings and the Blackwoods were our vassals, but they betrayed us and usurped the crown. Every black, every Blackwood is born a torn cloak. You do well remember that when you are making terms. So they both say the same thing about the other. Uh, we were kings, they were vassals. Um, what What's the truth here? What ended up happening? And I think when you look at the history of the Blackwoods, and sort of looking at what we were talking about earlier about the exile from the north and the Blackwoods needing to find somewhere to live. Uh, 
I'm going to I'm going to take a stab at this one and try and give the true history of what happened between the Blackwoods and the Brackens. Um so here in another you guys want about two more minutes and we'll complete the giveaway. Type Weirwood in chat if you want to win one. So here's my guess. I'm gonna be a <laughs> I'm gonna be a disloyal to the Blackwood fandom, I guess. I think the Brackens are probably right, or more right than the Blackwoods. Don't, don't revolt at me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all the other Blackwood fans out there. I think the Bla the Bracken story is probably more true. <laughs> I know. This, let me explain before, you know, I get destroyed for this take. The reason is the Blackwoods, as told through the history, not even like trying to tinfoil anything and not trying to try to connect things. They were told that the Blackwoods are latecomers to the Riverlands, that they used to be from the north, got exiled, and came south to find lands. And as I said, early Westeros was emptier than it is now, but it's not empty. And as refugees from the north, the Blackwoods would have had no lands themselves, and they probably didn't have a lot of military might. We're talking about people that were running for their lives. So that's not a group that has a lot of military power. That's not a group that has allies in the Riverlands. This isn't somebody that can just sort of show up and make themselves kings instantly. They probably would have had to swear service to somebody else. They probably would have had to become vassals and then over time earn their lands. Um, you see the same thing with the um, the Manderleys when they go from the Reach to the North. The whole, the whole uh, speech from the Manderleys about how we were sore beset and we had no allies and the Starks saved us, that probably would work for the Blackwoods too. They need help. They need somebody to give them a chance because they got nothing. They're running, like I said, they're running for their lives from the kings in the north. Okay, so how does that work? Again, they probably had to swear allegiance to some petty lord or petty king and basically have somebody give them a chance. Give them a chance in the Riverlands. Um... Being, being a servant or a vassal to the Brackens who over time built up their power and managed to overthrow them, that makes a fair amount of sense. Um, Liet Rubenfeld earlier suggested the Muds. That may have been true as well. At different times, the Muds and the Brackens ended up being overlords. But um, so Because otherwise, it, re it really doesn't make a lot of sense. How, did the, how would the Blackwoods who are exiled from the north, running for their lives, low on military power, probably no wealth to their name, basically a scattered, destroyed house. How did they get to the, to the Riverlands and suddenly just become kings? They probably didn't. It probably went the other way. They took the, their crowns from somebody else, and given their history with the Brackens, I'm going to guess they took them from the Brackens, that their crown and their lands used to be Bracken lands. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry for the hot take. Um. <laughs> I love the I love the Blackwoods. One of my favorites, but I'm gonna make the case that they probably stole those lands, or they were given them and then rebelled. Um, that's that's a fairly uh, fairly common story, especially even when you look at the Starks. Their history with the Karstarks and the Greystarks is um, them giving their family lands and then over time then building up enough wealth to eventually try and um, challenge their overlords for independence. Uh, the, well, the Karstarks haven't done that yet, but the Greystarks definitely did. Um, I know. I'm sorry. Yeah, truth hurts. I think the Blackwoods stole their lands from the, Bra from the Brackens. Which is, I think, would actually make a lot of sense because when you read A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, you're supposed... I th the Blackwoods are often depicted very favorably. 
They have awesome characters. They they are likable. They have a lot of cool stuff around them. Um, George likes them, so that that sort of tends to roll over into their characterization. Whereas the Brackens are pretty much depicted all the time as giant dicks. Um, <laughs> they are without a doubt the villains of the relationship. You're supposed to. Em- they're sort of like the Boltons to the. Uh, the Blackwood Starks. You're supposed to empathize with the Blackwoods and think the Brackens are assholes who are just making stuff up. But it would be kind of an interesting reversal if the, Bra- the Brackens are unlikable and they're assholes, but they may not be wrong. <laughs> they may have a legitimate point about the Blackwoods stealing stuff from them, but it was so long ago. Um, And it's especially strange that the (laughs) the Blackwoods basically just don't have an explanation of how they got there. The Brackens do. They said we were here first. This was our lands. We were kings and our vassals took us from it. And then the Blackwoods just went like, yeah, that happened to us too, even though we showed up later than everyone else. Um, Blackwoods becoming kings. It's like Rome where every random Etruscan passing through was given the crown before the Republic was formed. Um, I don't know much about Roman history to know if that one's right, but you like bitter steel. There are people who like bitter steel. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's do, let's roll the giveaway. Um, there we go. Um, don't know how to pronounce that one. Mirts to me. Mirts in me. Not sure on that one. Uh, congratulations though. Uh, so yeah, you can, um, send me a DM on Twitter, um, or you can email me at askjoemagician at gmail.com and I'll send you a code. You can pick up your free shirt from the Joe Magician shop. Uh, we'll do the next giveaway at 125 likes, got 110 now, so slam that MF and like button. And then at 150 likes, we'll put on the hat and maybe give away another one. Um, (laughs) just because you're right doesn't mean you're interesting brackets. Yeah, they're unlikable, but maybe right. At least about the initial cause. Um, I'm sorry, you guys can revoke my Blackwood fandom. You can take my card and rip it up and throw it away. I'm, I'm, I'm exiled. I'm an anti now, or whatever. But yeah, I think the brackets are probably right. It's the only logical way it makes sense, the story between them. Um, but getting away from the whole... <laughs> The whole how they got there. Let's talk about Raven Tree Hall itself, which is their home. It's actually pretty awesome. Uh, it's a fairly large castle, um, especially for the Riverlands. Uh, giant stone walls with square towers. Um, it has a big stone moat around it, a gigantic wooden keep on the inside. It's basically, if you read the description, it sounds like Winterfell. Raven Tree Hall sounds like Winterfell. With, and especially because they have a godswood with a giant weirwood in the middle. Um, although the Blackwood or the Raven Tree Hall weirwood is much bigger than the Winterfell one. Um, it's enormous, like the tallest one in the, in the south or close to it. Um, think like the size of the one that Jon Snow sees at, at a White Tree Village in, in the uh, beyond the wall. That, that size of weirwood, just an enormous one. Um, there's also the uh, peculiarity of Raven Tree Hall that despite the fact that their weirwood is dead, it has no leaves anymore. Every night, hundreds and thousands of ravens show up and roost in the tree. And they've been doing the same thing for thousands of years. Every night, thousands, hundreds of ravens show up and sleep in that tree. This doesn't happen basically anywhere else no idea what's going on here especially for a dead weirwood tree um seems a bit strange like i don't even think we've seen ravens in the weirwood at winterfell but here a dead one in the south all the ravens every raven in the area decides this is where they sleep at night uh which may be a connection back to the children of the forest the idea that ravens are often a preferred vessel for dead green seers um, they like flying and 
there's also the stories about you know the raven the ravens used to be able to talk um and that when bran uses his powers to touch a bunch of ravens minds he often feels dead green seers inside the ravens themselves so it's kind of strange but less strange when you consider it in in terms of connections to the children of the forest but yeah this this may be what's going on there's kind of a mystical connection there um that's canceled i'm sorry guys i'm canceled yep in a way you can sort of see the ravens as the leaves on the tree um there's no more of the red hands anymore but the the ravens and presumably skin changers do the same thing so the tree is is i guess dead in the sense it doesn't put out leaves but it's kept alive by um by the ravens and presumably the children of the forest kind of an interesting metaphor for the children of the forest in general you know they lost the war but they're still around that kind of thing um and the other really, really weird thing about the Blackwoods uh, that we talked about, somebody in the chat said earlier, is that they have the weirdest burial of anyone outside the Starks. Nobody else does this. We haven't seen this anywhere else in the books, and not anywhere I remember. The Blackwoods bury their family members under the weirwood tree. Like, they dig under the roots. I'm assuming there's some sort of catacombs or something like that. And they bury them under there. What the hell? No explanation for why they do this. Uh, most Northmen are buried in cairns or barrows in ancient times. And modern times they have essentially lich yards. The Starks are really weird with their crypts. Um, Blackwoods are doing their own thing. For no discernible reason. Um... Although there maybe is a discernible reason if you look at different examples. Basically what they're doing is they're giving their dead to the weirwoods, to the, to the old gods. Um, and we know that human sacrifice in old god religion was a huge thing. Um, that was an important part of the practice. They would uh, slit people's throats and let the blood wash over the roots basically in order to water or feed them. Um, we know that first men used to cut out entrails and essentially put them throughout the trees as kind of an offering to them. So in a sense, the Blackwoods give over their dead, their souls and bodies to the Weirwoods. Um, creates, again, with the raven idea, you can sort of see the ravens um, as kind of like the dead members of house blackwood that have become the ravens and stick around while their bodies are in the ground that kind of thing um well i mean i guess it's not like technically human sacrifice if they're already dead but they are giving over their corpses uh they're giving the tree sustenance through their through their family members and we know from um, especially White Tree Village up in the north, when John goes through there, he looks inside the mouth of the giant weirwood. And apparently what the people there do is after they sacrifice people to the tree, they put their, their bodies and their bones inside the mouth. So this is sort of a similar sort of ritual. Um, I think it all works to basically create the idea that this is like the human version of um, children of the forest and what they do with their dead when they die. Um, that they go into their trees, body and soul, that kind of thing. Again, this is very much tying it all together. The idea of the war king, the connection to the children of the forest, the magical weirdness of the Blackwoods, this burial practice and the, the ravens that roost there every night makes, makes kind of a dramatic, but not, explicit point about their connections between them which i think is kind of cool by george um so let's talk about the wars with the brackens um as i mentioned above after whatever happened with the founding of blackwood vale and raven tree hall um the blackwoods and the brackens have fought endless amounts of wars over and over and over again skirmishes pieces marriages the whole thing 
Um, they generally fight over a few different parts of the land sitting between them. There's obviously the Teats, um, the name of them, depending on which side of the Brackwood, Bracken and Blackwood uh, feud you sit on, which are essentially a set of hills. Um, another place called Battle Valley, and then there's Black Buckle Village. And I'm going to make a prediction here. This has to do with Duncan Egg and eventually the story of the village hero. I think Penny Tree has been fought over many times by the Blackwoods and the Brackens because Penny Tree sits between the teats, which is part of the thing that they fight over. And um, if you remember from Duncan Egg, Dunk's mentor, the knight, Sir Arlen of Penny Tree, is that's where he's from. Uh, one of the future stories that we're going to get from George, he, he says at some point, um, is going to be called the village hero. And there's also the idea that at some point, Aegon, or Egg from Duncan Egg, who eventually becomes King Aegon, he does end up marrying Betha Blackwood. So he's going to have to meet her at some point. And it, George has such an interest in the Blackwood and Bracken civil wars and the feuds between them. It would make a lot of sense if he ends up having Duncan Egg literally go there and see it on the ground. Like in A Dance with Dragons, we literally get both sides of the conflict told to Jamie Lannister. So George has it on his mind. Are we back? Are we back? Uh, I just had a connection. My internet just died. Are we there? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I don't... What was the last thing I was saying? I don't know exactly when it cut out. And I'm sorry, Aziz <laughs> says he doesn't have anything between his teats. Uh, all right. <laughs> I'll just put a penny there, buddy. Just, ha just wear a necklace with a penny on it. And you will have a penny tree between your teats. Um... I think I was talking about Village Hero and how we may, may end up going there. Um, no sternum. Yeah, Z's command with no sternum. Um, yeah, so I think that would make a lot of sense for what ends up happening there. That the Village Hero will be about Penny Tree and it will focus a lot on the Blackwood and Bracken feud. We'll see it on the ground from Dunk's perspective. Betha Blackwood will show up. She'll meet Egg. He'll be at the point where he's no longer a kid. He'll probably be 17 or 18 at that point. So maybe interested in girls at that point, which he's not now. Um, and yeah, George has a lot of interest in this. So I think that would make a lot of sense. Village hero, Penny Tree, calling it now, if we ever get there. Um, so... The, the actual wars with the Brackens are said to start about 500 years to 1,000 years before the Andal invasion, which is, of course, a big part of the feud. Um, I said the quote at the top, but yeah, the <clears throat> they keep fighting back and forth across the Red Fork. Somebody takes this village, somebody takes that valley. They fight to get it back, then they fight again to get that back. Somebody offends another member of the family. It's At a certain point, it doesn't really matter who was who took what from who it's essentially just an like an endless list of grudges just non-stop grudging between the two families where they sort of don't even remember what they're fighting about anymore like even if the brackens think that they should have blackwood veil vale, they had it so long ago and it's so far out of memory it's like what's the point um But it's one of those things that lords end up fighting over. They think they have claims to things and they want them back. And especially after the Blackwoods built up Blackwood Vale and the surrounding areas, it actually be it became very valuable. So both of them basically see the other as their antagonists. That the Blackwoods could finally go back to being kings if they could just wipe out the Brackens and take back their stuff. Uh, Brackens feel the same way. 
which is actually George comments on that in a little bit. We'll get to that. <clears throat> if a penny is small, then penny tree would be small. Uh, well, no, penny tree is named that because there's a tree that they nail pennies to for some reason. I never really got that one. I don't really know what's going on there. But um, <clears throat> but a George very much wants to show us penny tree at some point. Uh, Dunk thinks about it a lot. So I imagine it'll be coming up. So let's talk about the Blackwoods and the Andal invasion. Like I said, we're not, we're not, I don't think we're going to get to the modern times in this stream. We're probably going to have to do another one. Um, so you're going to do a very too long, didn't read on the Andal invasion. Um, the Andal people invaded from Andalos and ended up pushing themselves into the Riverlands. It's very likely that the Andals were pushed, pushed out of their lands west by the Valyrians, um, or one of the other, um, sort of empires in the area at that time. Maybe they get Sakari, although they're probably kind of far away. Valyrians make the most sense, or proto Valyrians, or something like that. Long story short, the Andals have to leave Andalos. They decide to get on ships and go west to Westeros. So, at this time, one thing you have to remember about the Riverlands is that all throughout their history, they are extremely divided. They Nobody takes control for long kings and empires rise and fall houses rise and fall lines of kings last like two generations and fall apart this is very very common and this is kind of true for the rest of westeros where there were very few large overlords as we would know them um where they held giant regions and had lots of armies and they were all united like behind the gardeners or the Durandans, or the Lannisters. Much, most of them had much smaller territories. They eventually expanded. So when the Andals show up, they don't find themselves with a united front of powerful kings and kingdoms that they have to knock over. Instead, they find sort of just a bunch of local shitheads who all hate each other and don't want to help each other do anything. So they initially have quite a lot of success knocking over these small kingdoms. Um, but as the Andals start making progress and they start chopping down weirwood trees and, um, dethroning people and taking their kingdoms, the first men finally get it together and go like, all right, well, we got to do something about this because we like our stuff and we don't want the Andals to take it. Um, the major king of this time was, was, uh, King Christopher. Christopher the fourth of house mud called himself the king of the rivers and the hills. So this is basically ruling from old stones. And this would have been most of the trident and a lot of the hills, the hills themselves refer to um, the hills on the south side of the Vale, um, the Vale, well, the Vale of Aaron, as it was called at this time, after the Aaron's conquered it from the Royces. Um, so it would have been like the neck downwards towards the trident the red and the blue and the green fork the hills in that region and maybe going a little bit east towards what's known as the crown lands and notably during this time the brackens and the blackwoods kind of look at each other and go like we're gonna lose everything if we keep fighting each other um so we gotta do something about the andals they team up they actually team up they forge an alliance and they do the same with the other kings of the rivers and They end up uh, saying, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna do this." Uh, before the Andals, there was I thought Justman came after. Hang on a second. Let me look up the Justmans. I was gonna talk about them later, but I thought that was after the Andal invasion. Yeah, no, the Justmans came after this, so we're gonna talk about that later. Um, Christopher Mudd um, and the rest of the Kings of the Rivers try to put up a defense against the Andals and sort of don't. They, they lose this one. Um, seven Andal Kings unite. They defeat Christopher. They end up capturing him and beheading him. And the Brackens and the Blackwoods lose at the Battle of what's called Bitter River. 
kind of a cool name. I kind of want to see that one. This would be a really good time frame for um, like a spinoff or something like that, especially with the Blackwoods and the Brackens. But um, to make a long story short, the Andals make make great waves into the Riverlands and basically the First Men have to surrender. Um, and, and in particular, the Brackens and the Blackwoods. But the Blackwoods somehow managed to keep the faith of the old gods. Um, either they feigned um, joining the faith of the seven or they just never did. The Brackens went the other way. They just they saw their new Andal overlords and said, all right, well, better off joining them than being persecuted by these weird religious zealots from Essos. So we're faith of the seven now. Um, also, this may have probably few, <laughs> fueled more of the feud between the two families because a major reason for the Brackens to convert to the faith of the seven is that so they got favor from overlords and different kings in the area, you know, to forge alliances and to make sure they have common ground between them. So the, the Blackwoods found themselves increasingly isolated and especially in wars, it may have been more likely that they lost territory and was given over to the Brackens, which then they ended up went to war to get back and blah, 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 blah. It goes back and forth. Um, and yeah, this really only increases the, the rivalry between them because when you think about how they think of each other after the Andal invasion, remember they are allies, they lost, and the Brackens completely flipped to the other side. They embrace the Andals, they embrace the faith of the seven, give up the old gods, give up their former allies, and say, we're on, we're on these guys' side. We're all in. Um, so the Blackwoods now consider the Brackens traitors, not only to their their people, and you know, they're basically family at this point, but um also traitors to the old gods. And the Brackens basically at this point treat the Blackwoods like punching bags that they can now make a religious reason for why they constantly go to war with the Blackwoods. That, you know, they're heretics, they're old god dicks, um, and they can essentially curry favor every time they attack the Blackwoods and also kind of have a, a built-in reason for doing it, the religious reasons. And yeah, this doesn't go very well. Uh, Billy Chops, in the present timeline, which Riverland house has the best claim as River Kings? Starting to think the Brackens were right. Um, best claim to the to the Riverlands? Uh, I mean, other than the Tollies? I mean, the Tollies have the best one. Um, the last River Kings before Aegon's conquest, God, who was it? Uh, it would have been whoever the Horrors threw over, right? Um, I actually can't remember that one. Does anybody in the chat know which River Kings the um I think it was Harwin Hor? Not which one they dethroned? I don't was it the Tullys? I don't remember. I think the Tullys being Lords of the Riverlands was a pretty new thing. Um It's a good question though. Because there's there's a lot of claims, and there's also there's quite a lot of um was it Mandrake? Root? On Darians, now they would have been from the uh, the Stormlands. Well, actually, when the when the horse showed up, they belonged. The Riverlands belonged to the Stormlands, so I'm not even sure. It it, it goes back quite a ways. Um, the Riverlands were not. Uh, actually, we're going to talk about that in a bit too. But um, one before the Tullys are now extinct. Yeah, the Durandans. I'm trying. to was it the Justmans? No, the Teague. It may have been the Teagues were the last River Kings. That may be right, Leah. Um, long time ago. Um, so, at this point, after the Andal invasion, the Blackwoods claimed that their great Rearwood died and that was poisoned by the Blackwood, by the Barakans. Uh, House Root. Okay. There's a lot of River Kings. It's hard to keep them all straight. Um, not really sure. 
So the um, this is a quote here from uh, Titus Blackwood talking to Jamie Lannister. Blackwood Solar was on the second floor of the cavernous timber keep. There was a fire burning in the hearth when they entered. The room was large and airy, with great beams and dark oats supporting the high ceiling. Woolen tapestries covered the walls, and a pair of wide, latticework do doors looked out upon the godswood. Through their thick, diamond-shaped panes of yellow glass, Jamie glimpsed the gnarled limbs of the tree from which the castle took its name. It was a weirwood ancient and colossal, ten times the size of the one the stone garden at Casterly Rock. The tree was bare and dead, though. The brackens poisoned it, said its host. For a thousand years it has not shown a leaf. Another thousand will have turned to stone, the maesters say. Weirwoods never rot. So this is the claim here. At some point, the weirwood of Raven Tree Hall, which may have been called something else at some point, it's but it sounds like the ravens were there all along. Um, the weirwood tree supposedly dies. It stops putting out leaves and from for a thousand years, but because weirwoods don't, don't rot and don't fall over basically it's just sort of sat there um <clears throat> so the question is how do you poison a weirwood how would you do that um it's kind of a bit unclear because they sort of have this undead immortal life um you know they require very little they can grow basically anywhere like the stone garden in cash they rock i think it's basically just like a cave with a little ray of light coming into it. Um, the weirwood at the night fort is punching up through the ground, kind of out of nowhere. Um, so, sort of just seems like they need human sacrifices every once in a while, and that's kind of it. That's that's the only sort of nutrition that the trees get. So, not really, not quite clear on it. Um, implications from places like White Tree Village is that the more blood and more human sacrifices that the trees are given, the bigger they get. So perhaps the Blackwoods tree got so big because they fed their weirwood quite a lot of bodies by burying their dead around it. Um, also quite possible that um, they spilled quite a lot of bracken blood as sacrifices over the ages, especially after the Andal invasion. Um, so that's probably how it got so big, but we don't really know. I don't really know how you kill it. In Dorne, they use Agent Lemon. Oh my God. Agent Orange. Um, and there's really only one other weirwood that's kind of similar to this. That's like struggling to survive. And that's the one at the Citadel. And it's actually weirdly, weirdly similar to the one at Raven Tree Hall. Um, Sam describes it. It was cool and dim inside the castle walls. An ancient weirwood filled the yard, as it had since these stones had first been raised. The carved face on its trunk was grown over by the same purple moss that hung heavy from the tree's pale limbs. Half the branches seemed dead. Elsewhere, a few red leaves still rustled, and it was there the ravens liked to perch. The tree was full of them, and there were more in the arched windows overhead all around the yard. So, it's the... Outside the rookery at the Citadel, there's kind of a similar looking weirwood that seems like half dead and full of ravens. Uh, kind of a strange similarity there between the two of them. Um, it's possible that like it's dying from lack of sacrifices because obviously the Citadel would not be sacrificing blood or humans to the tree. So maybe that's what's going on. It's like slowly starving to death. But it doesn't make a lot of sense that the Blackwoods would stop doing that because they kept the old gods the whole time. They would know the traditions um, and they're burying their dead underneath the tree. So, like, I don't even know how you would do that. I don't know how you poison a weirwood tree. Like, maybe if you buried a poison body underneath, like, would that do it? Um, I kind of looked up how would you kill a tree? How would you poison it? Like, if you want to do it in real life. And actually, one of the ways you could do it is salt. Uh, if you put a lot of salt around the base of a tree, it would be hard to get rid of and over and slowly it would kill the tree. It would kill the roots. So maybe that's what's going on. George likes the idea of um, people sowing salt in soil to make things not grow. Like that's what the Valerians did to the Giscari to create Slaver's Bay. They sowed the ground with salt so that nothing would grow. So maybe that's what they did. Maybe they put a bunch of 
salt in the um the ground around the tree and that caused it to die and the blackwoods found themselves unable or didn't know what they did so they didn't understand how to get rid of it um brackish water yeah maybe it could be something like that um brackish salt water could be um <laughs> it's kind of hard it's hard to it's not hard to do in current times it's hard to do in old times um you could kill a tree pretty easily nowadays with any sort of like with lots of different chemicals but it's a lot harder to do back in you old times especially with no internet um salt would be my guess that's that's maybe how they did it but yeah it's one of those weird things that george just kind of dropped in and um well it's it's not really a myth you can kill a plant by putting tons of salt in the soil it will kill it um but yeah i don't know i don't really have an answer to that one how do you kill a weirwood who knows release the brackens oh, aziz you're killing me um and so when you're looking at the blackwoods during this time um i was talking about how there's a lot of petty kings and you know there's tons of different houses that end up becoming it and a large part of the reason for that is that the riverlands are terrible to defend they are the worst position in westeros to defend anybody that has played a crusader kings to play through and played as the riverlands knows what i'm talking about it sucks it's the worst and the reason is um geography basically um when you look at the riverlands as a kingdom as it exists now it is bordered on all sides by the maximum amount of um of enemy or potentially enemy kingdoms they touch the north they touch the vale they touch the stormlands who used to own the crown lands touches the western lands and i believe there's even a border with the reach so at any time the riverlands could have as many as five or six enemies on all sides and that's ignoring the ironborn who are right there they are right there so the reason the errands in particular have been so stable and also you're looking at the dornish in the north is that they don't have a lot of land based enemies around them you know the veil basically only touches the riverlands um there's there's some overlap with the crown lands but it's not a lot the north is separated by the neck um and also you know the they they fight with the north over the three sisters a few times so that's kind of it dorn really only has a border with the reach and the stormlands and even that it's a heavily protected one by mountains anybody can march into riverlands at any time from any direction so what they end up having to do a lot of the time is the riverlanders have to make alliances with some one of their many potential enemies in order to hold off the others that ends up dragging them into quite a lot of conflicts that they wouldn't want to the veil vale doesn't have to join any wars it doesn't want to because they don't need allies they're pretty much they're good on their own um yeah as he's saying preach don't play as the riverlands and crusader kings in the game of thrones mod just don't do it it's not worth it you will get screwed trying to hold it um and that's the same thing that happens in the history of the riverlands um houses rise to power fall apart because not only is it you have to worry about your enemies around you any of your vassals who want your title who want to become the kings of the trident or the kings of the rivers of the hills themselves just find one of the other kingdoms make an alliance with them and use them to fight your overlord and you'll probably win that civil war so the king the kingship of the rivers just bounced back and forth over and over and over again um the longest standing kings of the rivers i think were the muds the muds lasted for quite a long time um but otherwise pretty much all kings of the rivers lasted like not that many generations and then completely fell apart um the blackwoods at some times found themselves as kings of the riverlands or close to it as much as you could but it's also hard to essentially <laughs> define the riverlands because 
at different points when you look back through the history they were just parts of other kingdoms um the the stormlands took them over for a long period of time westerlands had large parts of what we know as the riverlands the vale or the north would like it, it just continually shrinks and grows depending on um depending on who's in charge and who their allies are so <laughs> yeah at some point in this carousel of kings the blackwoods found themselves on top um but the most famous of them is uh we're Lee at Rubenfeld was talking about this earlier Benedict Rivers and House Justman so this is the most successful the Blackwoods have found themselves ever in the history of the Riverlands but it's kind of in a backwards way um if you never heard of Benedict Rivers this would also make a good tv show or a spinoff he is a bastard son of both the Brackens and the Blackwoods I don't remember which parent was in either but it um one of his parents was a Blackwood and one of them was a, was a Bracken and both families hated him <laughs> because he was a member of the other house. And it was like this walking symbol of their problems kind of in a way like Jon Snow kind of inherits a lot of similar things. Um, probably George reaching back to his Shakespearean roots. Like you can imagine a Romeo and Juliet situation. What if Romeo and Juliet had a child? Benedict Rivers is probably what it would, what it would have been like. Um, but instead of being surly about it or joining the Night's Watch like Jon Snow does, Benedict decides that he's going to fuck shit up. He's going to have a good time. Um, he trains himself and becomes a tremendous knight and a warrior even gets a cool nickname sir benedict the bold where george is explicitly linking him to barristan the bold in terms of skill as a knight and a warrior that's what you should think of with benedict rivers eventually benedict manages to heal the wound between the brackens and the blackwoods and ends up creating an alliance between the two houses through himself which is a pretty impressive thing. And this is sort of one of those meta things about George has to say about um, these sort of long-standing feuds and how they end up hurting everybody. Through the alliance of the Blackwoods and the Brackens, Benedict is able to use their military power and conquer the rest of the Riverlands, takes it all over. Um, and not just like House Mud's kingdom of the hills and the rivers. He goes further than that. He takes the whole kingdom of the Trident, which would be like the modern Riverlands or close to it. Um, just goes on a, a crazy winning streak. After he dethrones the last king of the Riverlands, he crowns himself king of the rivers, king of the Trident, but doesn't take either house as his name. He goes, he continues to call himself Benedict Rivers. He's not Benedict Blackwood. He's not Benedict Bracken. Um, and this is, I think, the most on the nose comparison between this is probably Stannis and Renly. Um, that in large part, Stannis and Renly's problem is that they are opposites, that they, that they feud with each other over, um, like weird little claim well not weird little claims i know stannis thinks he should have storm's end but he doesn't but there's this connection between them and all their flaws complement each other's strengths basically and it's long been said in the fandom that if you just got renly and stannis to work together they would have won war of the five kings in about half a day and it's probably true george kind of set them up that way he wrote them so that they are um like inverted versions of themselves. And it's the same thing here at the Brackens and the Blackwoods. If they could just put aside their problems, they could do everything they want. And that's what Benedict Rivers did. Um, and despite being a conqueror that dethroned a whole bunch of kings throughout the Riverlands, Benedict end up, ends up becoming quite a good ruler to the point that he, his nickname changes from Benedict the Bold, which I guess would have made his house House Boldman, which doesn't sound that good, um, they end up calling him Benedict the Just, that he is able to effectively mediate um, conflicts between his new vassals and is well known as a good ruler. 
So he likes the nickname and decides instead of being a Blackwood or a Bracken, he's he's going to name himself House Justman. Um, I actually have a pretty cool sigil. It's essentially a um, the scales of justice. It's a good one. The Justmans um, end up surviving against all odds for about 300 years, which is really long on the Riverlands. 300 years as Kings was in the Riverlands is basically unheard of. It doesn't happen since the Muds. Um, a bastard who unites the Riverlands become King sounds like very much foreshadowing for Jon Snow. Definitely. George loves the idea of um, that sort of unusual character that's, that straddles both lines and ends up becoming... Um, healing the wounds between them and sort of emerging from that into power and glory. Like Jon Snow's sitting with one foot in House Targaryen, the other side House Stark feels very similar here to Benedict Rivers. Um, that he may be the, the link that ends up creating the alliance between them. Um, did I make a video about Starks having strong blood in them? Yes, I did. Yep. Um, Worked with uh, Crow Food's daughter or Disputed Lands on that one. Uh, <laughs> and I, I kind of like that meta thing about this, that um, how the story of Benedict Rivers really works for foreshadowing as well as being a good story on its own. Um, and basically the, the Riverlands kingdom that Benedict bounds continues to, to exist for all that time largely because he decided to create a new house rather than piss off the other ones because obviously if he had declared himself a true blackwood he would have lost the support of the brackens if he declared himself a bracken he would have lost the blackwoods um ends up being sort of a neutral just path um also the nickname the just there's quite a lot of good reason to think that um if John ends up being some sort of monarch in the end, though, probably not like, um, he may get the nickname, the conciliator or the just or something like that. Um, although as it stands right now, he's going to go down as a traitor to the night's watch. So we'll see how that one goes. Um, but going back to the, to Benedict rivers and house Justman, um, yeah, that they end up lasting all the way until, uh, King Corrid Hor, King of the Iron Islands, the Thrones of Justmans, and this is essentially the beginning of the end for the Riverlands as a as a uh, a kingdom that stands on its own. After Corrid's conquest, um, nobody's really able to put much together. Um, the The Riverlands fact, uh, fractures back into petty kings, some who are loyal to the their new overlords, the Ironborn, some who are squabbling amongst themselves to get back to power. The alliance between the Blackwoods and the Brackens breaks down, so that power that power block in the center of the Riverlands is gone. Um, kind of sucks. Um, Benny the Just did a good job, though. As good as anyone can do in the Riverlands. Um, and actually, the, the Blackwoods falling out of power is kind of an interesting one. Um, before the last time that they tried to become kings of the Riverlands after the Justmans was through um, Lord Roderick Blackwood. So at this time, um, the Riverlands have been conquered by another random person this time house teague we were talking about earlier who are basically up jumped adventurers who used um i think SOC, soc mercenaries to conquer the riverlands and make them kings um and they ended up holding it for some amount of time i don't think it was particularly long but basically the riverlanders thought of the teagues like most of the reachmen think of the tyrells that they didn't deserve to be there so the Blackwoods essentially, like I talked about earlier, looked outside the Riverlands for an outside ally that they could make in order to overthrow the Teagues and take back the Riverlands. And Roderick Blackwood found it in the Stormlands. At this time, the Stormlands were still ruled by the Durandans. Um, why is House Justman an Andal house then? Uh, the Brackens intermarried with quite a lot of Andals, so I'm guessing that's what's, what was going on there. 
Um, King Arlen the Third Durandon of Storm's End. Roderick marries his daughter Shiera Blackwood. Hey, look, a Shiera and a Blackwood. What do you know? Um, to King Arlen, and basically says to Arlen, uh, "Marry my daughter, and then we'll use that alliance and we'll overthrow the Teagues and um, make the Blackwoods the king of the Riverlands, and maybe down the road, maybe your maybe the." your children with Shiera will like take the Riverland. Maybe we'll merge our houses more, that kind of thing. Basically just makes, finds an ally to do it for him. And, um, Oh, super chat from, uh, Kieran Grant, $10. Not anything interesting to ask you is keep talking that I can do. I can keep talking for quite a long time. Uh, thanks for the super chat. Appreciate it, buddy. Um, so that's what ends up happening. The, the Stormlands go to war with House Teague. The Blackwoods rebel against their overlords at this point, with the plan being obviously that Roderick becomes king of the Riverlands and has this solid power base with uh, King Arlen of uh, House Durandon. Doesn't go quite to plan. Um, Roderick ends up dying in a, what is it? The Battle of the Six Kings kind of ending the whole put the Blackwoods on the throne thing. There's some suggestion that maybe there was um, some, something up that maybe Roderick didn't die by accident in battle because what happens afterwards is so clearly benefiting Durandans that it, uh, it seems a little strange. So Roderick dies, but um, Arlen doesn't give up the case. He's, he continues the fight for the Riverlands through his wife, Shiera Blackwood ends up winning, dethrones the Teagues. And then <laughs> in a very strange move, Arlen goes to the, his new, his conquered Riverlanders and says, all right, so how do you guys feel about being ruled by Shiera Blackwood? Um, until I end up having a son or a child with her. And then that child will be your new overlord. And the Riverlanders say, we don't like it. Uh, for one reason, they don't want to be vassals to the Blackwoods because of, obviously, religious differences. Also because they don't want to be ruled over by um, a, a woman that's part of it. A bunch of misogynists. Um, so King Arlen says, all right, never mind. You're just a part of the Stormlands now. And that's kind of how it stayed for a long time. Uh, the Riverlands stopped being independent and were just a part of of the Stormlands. Um, it's actually one of the things the Targaryens kind of reversed when they took power is they, the crown lands were norm were not a thing. The crown lands were a part of the Stormlands, and so were the Riverlands. When uh, Aegon broke Argalac Durandon's back and took away and uh, took Storm's End, he broke it up into three different kingdoms instead of the one it was. Um, although there was some, Heron Horde did take it and turn it into part of the Iron Islands at one point, but he never, he didn't return the Riverlands back to the Storm Kings. Um, and that's kind of the last time the, the Blackwoods really had a chance to um, jump up into power. Since then, they've sort of just been serving one lord after another, um, fighting the Brackens, not really getting anywhere, and... Um, not really coming close to taking a throne, but not, not directly, I'll say. Oh, uh, Aziz, you guys are making videos with Amanda? Ooh, that'll be exciting. Talking about... You already did Giants. What are you going to do next? We gonna do, we're doing a video on Snarks? Grumpkins? Um... That would be a good one. Um, yeah, we definitely don't have time to go into um, after Aegon's Conquest and the Blackwoods. I think that'll be next stream, and we'll get a lot more into the history since the Conquest. Um, talk about House of the Dragon, Dance of the Dragons, all these other characters up until the current timeline as best we can. There's so many of them. George puts a lot in. They're very, very interesting. Um, some of my favorites, especially when you're talking about the dance with... Um, with Benjakot Blackwood and how they basically 
the the war in the Riverlands and how the the Blackwoods essentially took it over the um, the alliance with the Starks that started back then. Um, I wonder how much of the Reach's dominance in Westray politics is due to the Stormlands being broken up by Aegon I. A lot of it. The Stormlands were the dominant kingdom in Westeros for most of the history. Um, they controlled the entire East Coast up to the, um, at different times, up to the Vale. They often were able to smack around the Riverlands and take whatever they want from them. Um, the Reach and the Stormlands are the basically the primary rivalry in um, the mainland of Westeros itself. Um, the Westermen ended up being like second fiddle to them. The Vale kind of stayed, stayed out of conflicts for the most part. It's mostly the Stormlands and um, and the Reach that were the the primary forces of what was going on. Because the North kind of just stuck, uh, stayed to the on their own. They didn't really come south too often, except to except to screw up the uh, the Ironborn after they took something. Um, and when they were fighting with the Vale, and that's kind of it. That's one of those things where when you're playing like Crusader Kings and you go back in time through the different timestamps, like any time before Aegon's conquest, just pick one and like it's just a giant blob of the Stormlands owned by the Durandans. Um, yeah, the one place they couldn't conquer was Dorne. Nobody could conquer Dorne except for Nymeria. But Dorne also couldn't conquer them because the Reach and the Stormlands were the two most powerful kingdoms. So ended up being this weird stale stalemate between them where neither one could knock the other out um, and their conquest just couldn't last. But they could definitely take crap off of the Riverlands and carve it up like a, carve it up like a Tywin Lannister carving an elk. Um, I think we'll talk about we're going to leave Agnes Blackwood <clears throat> and the uh, the whole conquest of the Riverlands till next time, but I think it's kind of it's kind of funny. There's so much history here for the Blackwoods and what they are doing throughout all this long history, but there's not really a lot of names on them. So this is all kind of like dis zambi. What's the right word? Um, there's not a real face on this. Like we get some names here with Benedict Rivers and Roderick and Shira Blackwood, but that's kind of it. Most of them um, just sort of. It's more describing the house as a whole rather than the individual people. We're definitely going to get into the people next time. Um, and probably a lot more into their... What's going on with them with the children of the forest and the magic and stuff like that as we're going to get closer to Bloodraven. I mean, obviously I have full streams on Bloodraven. Um, but those are largely having to do with who he is in terms of him being a Targaryen. They're not really uh, talking about his Blackwood side. Like um, one of the more fascinating things about the Blackwoods is that I think the most recent non-Targaryen to marry into the, um, the, the royal line is the Blackwoods through Aegon the, Aegon the fifth um, with Betha Blackwood. And it's kind of interesting that on both sides of John's lineage, there is Blackwood um, blood coming through the Targaryen and the Stark side. It's like, I talked about this with the Strongs previously, how there's sort of this weird undercurrent of how they just sort of keep popping up and because of their, because of the way that they behave and kind of their sluttiness, I guess, um, the strong blood just sort of goes everywhere. It just kind of balloons outward. So that's kind of like, a lot of the major characters are strong um, in some way, whether or not they know it or not. But the Blackwoods is like the official version of that, where their bloodlines and their marriages have been so stable and so good for them in particular that it's hard. <laughs> like George just keeps having major characters that are tangentially related to the Blackwoods. Um, like when you're talking about Bloodraven and Bran, that's the connection they share. The direct connection is that they both um, are related to the Blackwoods. Yeah, an interesting connection to the Blackwoods and the Mannerings. They're kind of inverses. I think that's why uh, History of Westeros did them both. I think they did the Blackwoods and the Manderleys because you can sort of use one to inform the other. George writes them as um, mirrored stories. 
So whatever you don't know about the history of the Blackwoods, you can probably grab from the Manderleys and vice versa. Um, so, yeah, two generations of the incest ever, Aegon V, the Dane blood from Aegon's mother. That's right. Um, it goes Targaryen, Targaryen, Blackwood, Dane. That's Danny's history and John's history going back. Uh, well, John also has the added Stark. So that's going back four generations. I know some people think that that's like um, a plan that they're trying to like genetically birth a savior. I, I, I tend to think of it in terms of just being like a neat factoid, but it is definitely something that for some reason the Starks are all skin changers right now. Um, not really sure. Yeah, that's true. The dude, we're all related to Charlemagne or Genghis Khan. Choose which one. Um, Ever made the connection between Blood Raven and Brand? You said they're both kin. Well, distantly related, very distantly related. But yeah, they do share. Um, they're probably like third or fourth cousins, something like that. Um, I forgot the last time. Well, it may be further back than that. I'm trying to remember the last time the Blackwoods married into the Starks. Was it Cregan? Cregan Stark may have been uh, when he married Black Alley. That's probably the last common ancestor they would have, but that's that's not that far back. That's only a couple hundred years. Even pruning the family tree. That would be that'd be weird. I don't know why we would do that. Um, and of course, the Targaryen family tree is more like a Targaryen pole. It's not really a tree, just kind of this one line of incest going down. <laughs> yeah, the hour of the wolf. That would have been the last time. So that would have been 150 years, roughly, before the start of the current story. So, yeah, Bran and Bloodraven are relatively closely related through the Blackwood line. Um, John and, Bl and Bloodraven, too. Uh, on both sides of John's family, he's related to Bloodraven through the Targaryen and the Blackwood side. Ned's grandmother was a Blackwood. So that would have been Cregan's wife, right? Hang on a second. Let me look this up. <laughs> Let me see the House Stark family tree. And this is sort of what I meant at the beginning where we are talking about like the weird ways that the Blackwoods keep showing up. Um, this is one of the ways where when you look back at family trees, George just keeps throwing Blackwoods at like primary characters. Uh, so Rickard, Edwile... Melantha, Blackwood, and Willem. Oh, so that's the most recent one. That's not that far back. So that's one, two, three, four generations back. Bran and John would be related to the Blackwoods. And before that, you have uh, Regan and Black Alice. Um, right? Yeah, Alice and Blackwood. Although I forget if that line, where that line ended up going. Um, John to sound similar to I'm not gonna try and pronounce that one, but yeah, a lot of Doom connections there. Um Oh, my stomach just rumbled, so I think I'm probably gonna go eat lunch. Um I think that's probably it for today. Um We'll probably be back in well, in two weeks I have to work, so three weeks we'll be back for another stream. And next weekend, uh, you can check, catch me on History of Westeros. We'll be talking uh, Valyria, I think. Let me check the, the dates on that one. Well, Aziz is watching, so I'm guessing on the 6th, I think I'm so, we're going to come on. Um, didn't get as far as I wanted, but this was one of those times, again, like I said the tar at the start of the stream, that I just started writing my outline and like, reading through the world of ice and fire and seeing this stuff and just kept finding interesting things about them. And I think that's kind of indicative of how George feels about the Blackwoods there. You can sort of tell which houses and which lines he has passions for because he continually reinserts them into his story. The strongs are like that. And the Blackwoods are both like that. You can tell he has a real fondness for them and that he continually wants to use them in different ways. Um, Especially when, like, if we're talking about the potential village hero, 
I mean, that would definitely involve the Blackwoods. That would involve the Strongs, likely through Dunk, and then you have the Targaryens. And it's like, it's all pulling around these different families. Um, <laughs> so if, and definitely in terms of if you want to try and pick a house <laughs> that George will definitely continue developing in some way, uh, can't go wrong with the Blackwoods. Yeah, the 6th. All right, cool. Yeah, check us out then. Uh, January, oh, March 6th. Whoa, I forgot the month there. Uh, Beyond History of Westeros. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out this afternoon. Thanks for subscribing and hitting the like button. Uh, if you guys want t-shirts, make sure you send me a DM on Twitter or email me at askjoemagician at gmail.com. I'll send you guys your codes. Um, I hope you all have uh, a happy Saturday and join us. I'll be back in three weeks and we'll talk about Blackwood's post conquest or actually, no, we'll start at the, the, uh, conquest of the ironborn of the riverlands, the last one. And we'll move forward from there. We'll be talking a lot more about house of the dragon dance of the dragons, those kind of characters. So yeah, look forward to that one. Um, I'll probably make the stream <laughs> ahead of time so that you can like, um, put a like and a reminder on it. But yeah, thanks everybody. Hope you have a good weekend.